So this interview is with Beth Potter, um, who has enjoyed a successful career in two sports, on the track and in triathlon. Indeed, in 2018, she made Scottish history by becoming the first person to compete in two different sports at the same Commonwealth Games, in the 10,000 metres on the track and in triathlon on the Gold Coast in Australia. It was on the track that Beth, who grew up in Bears Den, where I live, first showed early promise. In 2008, she, was, she won the Scottish Under-15 Championships in cross country and the 1500 metres on the track. Just listing a few of her many accolades, because there are many. In 2014, with a home crowd cheering her on, Beth finished fifth and ninth, respectively, in the 5,000 metres and 10,000 metres double at the Glasgow Commonwealth Games. She went on to qualify as the second fastest British woman over 10,000 metres for the Rio Olympics in 2016. The following year, in May 2017, Beth won the 10,000 metres at the British Trials, her first race on the track since the Olympics, which gave her a place at the 2017 World Athletic Championships in London. In the same year, she announced she was planning to make the transition to triathlon with a view to competing at the 2020 Summer Olympics. We'll come back to that since obviously the 2020 Summer Olympics will not be happening now. In her first, triathlon, first year of triathlon, she finished third in the elite race at Blenheim Palace Triathlon in the June. She won the elite race at the Cardiff Triathlon and she also, also took gold in the ETU Sprint Triathlon European Cup in Portugal. The following year, she took 12th place in the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games in the individual race and two months later won silver at the ITU Triathlon World Cup in Antwerp. In 2019, Beth won gold at the ETU European Championships in Holland. And most recently, just before we went into lockdown, she took second place in the 2020 ETU Duathlon European Championships held in Spain. The time was an impressive 58-54. Beth is still competing in athletics too, and earlier this year, she proved she still has superb speed when she won the England Athletics Five Mile Championships. Her time, is the f third fastest of all women in the UK ever and the second fastest ever in Scotland. She finished in 25.34, that's for five miles by the way, with only Paula Radcliffe in 24.47 and Lisa Colgan in 25.25 having ever run faster. Beth lives in Leeds where she trains with an elite group of athletes including the Brownlee brothers and she is still only 28. So welcome Beth, you've had an amazing amazing bunch of accolades already thank you <laughs> and i had to pray see because there were so many so and i actually did check with her just to make sure i'd not missed anything too vital and she told me i had not so i'm going to start as we usually try to do with these interviews um just to tell us a bit about sport as a youngster i think you came from a pretty sporty family or you've come from a pretty sporty family you tell us yeah um so i think I don't know I think my earliest memory is just from the swimming club and um, so that's actually where I started off so I swam with um, Muldown Bears Den um, and I, I like, loved that my mum couldn't get me out of the water but um, yeah I come from a pretty sporty family my mum mum and dad and my sister all all run still um, my dad's a good marathon runner and um, he hasn't quite broken the three hour mark for the marathon but he's been ever so close um, and my sister runs competitively as well um, so yeah no, just from a young age just it, that, that was the one thing that I mean my parents put us into everything every sport um, but it was definitely like swimming um, where, where I started um, and when I went to secondary school it kind of running took off from there with PE teachers um, who you know who were, who were good runners and that's how I really got into it. And there was that Bears Den Academy that you went to? Yeah, so it was actually my PE teacher, Mrs. Chapman. And yeah, she's, I still hear bits and bobs from her. Um, so uh, yeah, it was, I think I, I, I didn't actually do a lot of running, but I was really fit from all the swimming. Um, and I did a, a, one of these school, kind of in between school races and won it. And then went to the Scottish um, cross country champs, I think it was, and finished. Well, I mean, I, I think I thought I was first, but apparently I was second it was like kind of on the on the line <laughs> and I was given second place so and then I'd, I I kind of I joined a club from there and soon sooner or later the you know I had I did lots of other activities after school and I had to bribe my mum to let me go to running club instead of wind band so it was a <laughs> one of those um sort of like 
trade-offs almost. And were you competitive with your sister when you were younger? I don't know if you're the youngest or the oldest. No, I, I'm the oldest. Um, yeah, I, th- I think, yeah, I'm very competitive. She's not, she's not so competitive. She like, she, I still train with her a lot and I run with her when I go home, but she's, she can kind of let, let it go. And, you know, I, I just always would, <laughs> I think I was too much for her. Like it was always too much of a competition between me and her. And I, I, I everything, everything was a competition with me. It was, and I just don't think she, she's not like that. She's way more chilled out and laid back with st- stuff like that. But you probably need that, don't you? If you're gonna if you're gonna make sport a career, you probably need the innate competitiveness. Yeah, no, but I still like the fact that I can go home and you know, like my 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 dad always was gutted that he he had girls almost. He always used to say, "Oh, I always want I always wanted boys so I could play football." But I'm so glad I can run with my girls. So you know, that's that's a nice thing about it. And I, I love when I, I go home like for Christmas, and it's quite I, I'm not home very very often, so it's nice to go home and like we can all. Uh, go out for runs together so that's that's still really really fun and then you went to Loughborough University and presume your choice of university was because of the sport yeah so it's actually I had offers from Glasgow and Edinburgh as well um but I was dead set on moving away from home and I think I went to view Bath University and Loughborough and and I like I love both and both were good for running especially endurance running at the time and um I think what swayed me was that I went to visit Loughborough on a sunny day and everyone was out, <laughs> out playing sport on campus and I remember like I didn't I don't even I hadn't even gone to the the physics department yet to look around and I had already decided I was like mum I'm coming here <laughs> like it was it was, it was a no-brainer for me so yeah yeah and, and when did you then decide that career the career in sport was for you was that at university or before or <laughs> I mean, I've always, it's always been a dream. It was always a dream to make it to, to the Olympics and, and compete on like on the world's biggest stage. Um, whether I actually believed that until maybe 2014, whether I could do that, yeah, that's a different, that was a different kettle of fish. But, you know, it's so, it's so, it's so difficult to make the step up, especially like you, you can be a really successful junior. And there's, <clears throat> there's been so many girls, you know, in my age group that haven't made it. And, it's it's nice that there are actually still <clears throat> a handful of us that are still that still run and I that I've been I've grown up with on like junior junior teams and we're all still running so that's that's really nice but it's it's just hard and you know like whether you want it to make it a career it, it just depends on you know how how that step up goes it's you can't really predict it and that's why you know I was adamant on getting a degree and getting a getting something solid that I could fall back on if it if it didn't go to plan because there have been many many times down the road that I've wanted to give it in uh, like give it all up and and not do it so yeah I'm glad I I'm glad I stuck stuck with it but it's it was a tough journey definitely and so tell us about some <coughs> of what you would consider your best achievements on the track because if you were first of all competing very successfully weren't you at 5,000 meters and 10,000 meters before you then went into triathlon? Yeah, I think 2014 was a big, um, you know, big turn, like turn point for me. I was, I was, I'd graduated from uni and I, I was, I just made the move up from an under 23 athlete and I was trying to make, break it. I, no, I, I was still under 23, but I was trying to break onto the senior, you know, senior rankings. And that's a, that's, that's a hard thing to do. Um, it's, I found that that quite difficult and I was I was currently doing I was doing my PGCE which is my teacher training at the time so I was I was working and I was in school five days a week and I was you know trying to run these qualifying times um so yeah I think that that year was was a big um like a kind of pivotal turning point for me I made three four senior teams that year and um yeah I think that was like my performances that year on the track were probably like consistently one of the best um, and it, it was like really where I started to believe that you know going into that season that I, I thought oh, I, I could make Glasgow that'd be awesome but I was still like at the time a long way off the time and then then I did the then I did the, no I didn't actually do the five it was <laughs> funny story I I didn't want to run the 10k and I, it wasn't even on my plans and I, I planned all season with my coach to go to the states and run the time and I kept missing it by like hundreds of a second over 
like 5k and it was really frustrating and last minute I didn't have the time was running out to run the qualifying time and I had to run it twice um and it was a Thursday night and the Highgate trial was on the Saturday and my coach was like you should en- you, you need to enter Highgate you need to run the 10k and I actually had a falling out with him I was like I'm not I'm not doing a 10k I'm not doing it it's too long <laughs> And I was like, I'm totally unprepared for this. I'm not, I'm not doing it. And I, I, I got bullied into it. Wasn't really speaking to him before the race. Did it, ran the qualifying time by about 45 seconds and then had to <laughs> grovel my way back with my coach and say, yes, that was a good idea. So yeah, um, I think that year was definitely my performances at Commonwealth Games. Like I think I you know, surpassed expectations there. But then having a home crowd, how did that feel? It must have been amazing. Yeah, it's to be honest, today to to this day, it's still my my favorite event, favorite championships, favorite race to run. Ten K is a grueling event. It's you know it's a long way. It's hard, but it's it was one of the most enjoyable thirty two minutes of my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you announce your transition to triathlon. I don't know if many people expected that. I guess. Um, but why did you decide to do that? Um, I think, you know, for a while I, I did cons- I did want to do it after Glasgow. And I thought, I remember watching, so I know it was before, I remember watching Alistair and Johnny um, compete in, in London. And I was actually sidelined that track season with a parasite, which I picked up in Kenya. Um, so I wasn't able to compete. And I remember watching the, um, the Olympics that summer and I had the, a real bug for it then. Um, and I had a bit of a change of change of um coaching situations that summer and and then you know like with Glasgow being a home like a home city for me it was it was on my doorstep I just thought I I can't really I I can't not give this a go and try and make make a a home team in in a home city like that doesn't come around that often and especially in an athlete's kind of career so that was the the that's where I wanted to stay on and then I had such strong performances at Glasgow I was like oh well I can't, I can't give it up now I need, I need to try for the Olympics like that's that would be daft to to not go for the Olympics and it was always a goal of mine um, and I think it came at, came at a good time like I I didn't compete as well as I wanted to at the Olympics for like you know, I had um, a gastro bug that came on the night before so very unfortunate timing but um, you know I, I don't have any regrets leaving athletics then and I just think, think it was the right time and you know, it was at the start of the next Olympic cycle. It would have given me a good opportunity, like a good chance to get um, to grips with a new sport. And so you've already said that you were a good swimmer as a child and also um, obviously good on the track. So it's the cycling that then yeah. would be the, the difference. So what have you seen as the difference in terms of training and sort of the load as a triathlete? So I, I very quickly realised the amount of training that was involved. I, I moved to Leeds and I actually moved in with Johnny Brownlee. Um, so kind of, he took me under his wing a little bit and, you know, like just seeing him train when I, when I first moved up, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't comprehend how they did so much. Like I was used to training twice a day. I, I ran twice a day, five days a week. And then like I ran every day, but five of those days were double days. And I just couldn't get my head around the hours that they used to spend, they would spend on the bike and then doing a swim and then going straight out for a run then going to the gym. I was just, I was just like, what have I, I actually spent the first nine months of Leeds, I think in tears every day. Um, and I just, I couldn't, I couldn't understand how, how they did it and how they just didn't get tired or how they, how they could recover in between sessions. It was just alien to me, to be honest. Um, so that, that was my <laughs> You managed to get on with it though in the end. Yeah, no, it definitely took me to about 2018 to be to, like, to feel comfortable with the training load. And I think as well, the coaches didn't know like what I could, what I could handle, what I, you know, how much they could throw at me. Um, so it was a kind of gradual process of like decreasing the running and then upping everything else. Um, and I, I definitely had some injuries that year that, you know, I, I hadn't been in the pool for eight years. So I had a couple of shoulder problems. Um, I'd certainly never ridden a bike with cleats. So I think I feel like I've come a long way in three years. I, I'm now, I don't want to say competent, but I, I feel like I can hold my own on a bike now. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was a big learning curve. But I, mean, I was here, with, I've got the best people to train with. And I did find it quite hard. Um, you know, I was, I was used to being 
in like in a group of runners that you know I was one of the best and then I, I came to Leeds and we've got some of the best athletes in the world here in this training group and you know I'd, I'd go to the pool I'd get absolutely smashed I'd go to the bike sessions I'd get smashed and I did all my running with the boys so I would I would get smashed so there was no there was no opportunity for me to actually go to a training session and come away feeling like oh I did well there because I just constantly felt like I was off the back or getting dropped or something. So it was, it was really hard and just like adjusting my focus from not being so like caught up with the times I used to run when I was on the track and just taking a step back and, and, you know, just being like, this is a new journey. This is, I need to just start fresh slate and, and see, you know, um, what, what I can do with what I'm doing now. So. And if you had to build up strength and for bike, for the bike training uh yeah so it, you know like I found I often I found that it was my legs that would go before my heart and lungs so I had to you know I had to get you know just it would just took time and everyone just told me it's just going to take hours on the saddle and it's going to it's just going to take time you just you can't rush this it's you need to be patient with it you yeah and I, that's not something I'm very good at being <laughs> I want it now and yeah so that was difficult and training with these names, big names, was it intimidating? Or you, you possibly said it, you've suggested it might have been, or inspiring, or a mix of both? Yeah, a little bit mix of both. Like I, I found it quite hard initially moving to Leeds because it was such, you know, it's such an elite. I came from an elite group in London. You know, I trained with Steph Twell and a lot of other girls on the track there. So I suppose when I moved there, it was the same problems. But yeah, coming here, you just got so many like so many that are good at their game and it was just hard and I think with the fact that there was a lot of groups already established and I didn't I didn't know anyone and maybe people saw me as a bit of a threat because of my track pedigree it was just hard um but everyone everyone was so welcoming and it was you know like I once I got to know the roots and once I got pally with the girls and guys it was it was fine and I think it's important to train with people that are better than you so I, I actually have um I now train with the runners here um, so there's Laura Waitman who who competed in London and Rio. She's a 5K runner, so I do a lot of my sessions with her now. Um, and I think it's important to to train with people that are better than you because that you know you kind of if you surround yourself with successful people or people that are better than you, you're always going to aim for a little bit higher. So yeah. yeah. And um, we mentioned this before. You the, were the first. Scottish person to compete in two sports at one Commonwealth Games. Um, yeah. Did you expect that? Did you expect to be competing in both? Um, well, I think I'd already run, I ran the trial that the year before, so in 2017, I ran the, because the only one I hadn't ticked off was the World Champs and I kind of wanted to do that. So I, I ran the trial not knowing what I could run and I, I won and qualified. So I, I'd already run the qualifying time for the track. So that was kind of in the bag. Um, but I hadn't, because of the way it works in the triathlon system, you have to do, you kind of have to climb the rankings. So you have to do the national races first and then Europeans. And then if you do well at the European races, you can go on to the World Cup scene and then World Cup scene, if you do well, there you go, WTS. So it was a very, very steep learning curve that summer. I think I competed four times and two of them were national races. So I didn't have many opportunities to qualify for Commonwealth Games. I think I had two opportunities and the first one was a week after I'd done the 10k in the track so my legs were in bits so that didn't happen then so I had basically one race to try and do it so it was just I mean it was a goal but I didn't I didn't actually know if I was going to be able to do it so it was yeah it was it was ambitious but I'm not one for setting um, goals that aren't so <laughs> um and I think it, I read that it your well, it said that your biggest triathlon win to date was a gold medal at the ETU World uh, European Championships in Holland in May last year. I think you won by almost a minute. Tell us about that race, how that went. Um, so that was, I, I, I kind of, no, I didn't know I was going to win actually, but I just going into that race, it was, you know, it was like an ideal course for me. Um, if I did things correctly, you know, if I, if I set it up well for myself. Um, and... I had a, I had a really good swim. I was actually I, I got quite a good start on the it was it wasn't a pontoon it was a like a kind of man made beach sort of thing so it was a 
running so, so that that's that's always good for me um so yeah I, I got on to so two of the uh, the two of the brits they're very good swimmers so i managed to, they they lined up either side of me so i was sandwiched in the middle so as soon almost as soon as they did that i was like right this is great i'm gonna have a good swim i'll get on one of their hips and yeah that was a, that was the case it was this i made front pack on the swim and once i knew i was in that bike pack and i, I was there for the first lap i was like not not that i knew i had it tied up but i just thought right as long as you stay in your bike and come off with this group there's no one in, the, in this group that can run quicker than you just just try and do uh, as little work and come off the come off the bike feeling as fresh as possible so and 10k favors me so once we got off the bike um i i did hit I did hit it hard at the first bit and then I tried to wind it up, but yeah, I think within 800 meters of coming off the bike, I was in the lead. So, yeah. Oh, brilliant. Are there any other standout races um, for you in, I suppose, the, the short triathlon career that you've had that you felt went well or that you had a good result? Um, I think there was a couple of races last year that not necessarily went well, but I mean, I was either carrying an injury or there was one where I came off my bike and I think like, yeah, I think you learn. I think you learn more from the races where you don't do so well, or not not that you don't do so well, but where things go wrong and how you deal with that as you go along. So I had, I had a bit of bad luck towards the end of the season where I had a shoulder injury, but um, and it happened mid race. I got slammed up against a kind of stony bank in a race, and um, I think like just for me, like I know I know I'm a tough competitor and I know I can, I can do that, but it was more like. I had issues in that race and it was like the mental side where I, I still I didn't I didn't give up and I salvaged a result from it and I think like I was proud of those results even though it's, it's easy to say when you do well because you can look back and be like oh well I didn't nothing went wrong I you know I think you learn more from the races where you where you know things didn't go to plan or you really had to dig in for something and then another one it was the Banyolas one where I came off I was trying to be bullshy on the bike. I was trying, to, <laughs> I was trying to move the bike along, and I went a bit too fast, and I came off. But you know, I got back on and I finished, and I, um, it wasn't a, it wasn't a great result, but it was still, you know, I, I came off, and had I stayed on my bike, I know I could have gone well, but it was, you know, finishing and, um, dealing with, the kind of, um, the coming off the bike that you know I, I think I learned a lot from, you know, getting a result. So. And of course, um, the Olympics has been postponed for the year. So, you know, every, lots of athletes are in the same position. Um, how have you dealt with that? You know, how have you, how's training been in lockdown and the sort of mental side of not being able to compete this year? Uh, it, I think it was, um, so I, I remember sitting in this exact position the, the night that Abu Dhabi was called off and I was, I was supposed to be going to that race and it was called off maybe like five days before and it was, I found it really difficult to get myself back up after after that was called off, um, and it's it's just really hard when you have a whole season kind of all everything was planned out for me. I knew where I was going. I knew where I was racing, you know. I, and I had such a good winter, and I'd worked on I'd worked on like my swimming and my biking, and they were in a really good place. And I was like excited to see what I could do this season. Um, so yeah, it's it's really it was really frustrating, but. I don't know, I found a bit of peace during all this time and I've, I've had time to like work on the things I wasn't like, you know, that I wasn't ready for. So I, I really needed, one thing I needed was extra time, just needed a bit more time uh, across like, you know, being get, getting stronger in the pool and getting stronger in the bike. And it's like I've kind of been thrown a lifeline. So I don't know, in, in a way it's, it's, a, it's gutting, but it's, it's given me that, that time that I needed to get stronger and fitter on the bike and in the pool. So... I've come to and have you been able that. to swim? You've been able to swim then through lockdown? Uh, sort of, yeah. <laughs> I have got a, I've got a ski machine at home, um, so I've been doing that, which is, you know, arm dominant. Uh, yes, I've done a bit of swimming. I was uh, yeah, and I went to, down to do some open water last week in the river with my coach. So, yeah, I feel like swimming is every time I do a bit of swimming, I just go hard. So I'm I'm trying to keep that ticking over at the moment. And I also wanted to ask you, um, so I've read a little bit that you have problems with stress and anxiety before races and that you've used um, a psychologist to help you with that. How, how, what's the techniques been and how's that helped? 
Um, so I started seeing, so I started seeing my psychologist. Uh, the one I started seeing was in London. This was back in December of like 2013. Um, and I did notice a big change in that. That's the following summer. Uh, that's when I had my summer at Glasgow. Um, and then I actually started seeing someone more recently in Leeds. Um, and I just find it's, it's useful to talk to someone. I mean, they're both sports psychologists, but just to give me like, because with the running, I was I was switching off mid race, and I couldn't understand why I'd get dropped. I and I wouldn't notice until, you know, the damage had been done, and I couldn't get back on the pack. So it was like it was just kind of getting more in tune with what was going on in my head during races. Um, with triathlon, it's been a bit different because it's I was getting this stress and anxiety because of the swim part of the of the race, and I just found it really like I feel like on the track I can hold my own a bit more but in in the water I would get stressed because I was getting held under I was getting into bad situations or you know and I found it quite stressful so it, you know it would really bring on a lot of anxiety so it was more like coping how to cope with it we, we sat down and we looked at um sort of progress goals so things that I could you know think about for each section of the race um and maybe just choose three um for a race so I, I tend to split them into like, you know, breaking down each section of the swim, bike, run, um, or even like the parts of the swim. So the first part, the middle part, and then coming towards transition and just thinking of three things that, you know, that I can have as a checklist almost to tick off. Um, and we just, yeah, we worked on that. And I, I feel like last season we really got it sort of nailed. Um, and yeah, it seems to be working. So, yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, and then also the one thing we wanted to ask, and we did note this last week, because somebody, we were chatting um, about how we can keep uh, female, young females in sport. So we, in our club, we've got lots of um, youngsters, male and female. And then typically around the sort of mid teenage, later teenage years, they move away from sport and sometimes they come back in their twenties. But how, what would you suggest are the ways that we could possibly keep girls in particular in the sport triathlon or even in running throughout those sort of later teenage years um well i, th I think for me i had i had a lot of good female role models when i was growing up so that was really that was really good so that you know people that i would look up to and would want to like would be inspired by um and then i think as well like there's I mean, there's sometimes too much pressure put on at that age like to I don't know maybe from coaches or parents but like to make it fun and to have like I always find like I mean Tuesday nights are still my favorite nights of the week because I get to go to track with all my friends and run around the track like I love that and I, I always did when I was younger as well so that, like I don't know whether the enjoyment part is taken out but I think it's important to keep you know to, to do something with a, a, a group of peers that you know you have fun to keep it to keep it fun um and then, I don't know, those are my two main ones, but I, th I think as well, like, for girls not to feel like they, like, I don't know, sometimes they think it's undesirable to be, like, sweating and working out, but I think that's, I think that's the, the fun bit, and you, you, you always, I don't think I've ever done exercise and not felt better afterwards, I think it's such, and it's, I think a lot of people have realised that during this time like I see so many people out doing exercise now that and I've lived here for three like three years and I've never seen in on my street do exercise and I see them exercising daily now so I think like it does help with a lot of um anxiety um and mental health and it's just it gives you time to just to think and clear your head so yeah, it's think, maybe getting that message across isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. That was lovely. Um, so now we're going to open up <laughs> to the new members. So be aware of the questions now. Okay. <laughs> There's always some good questions. I'm sure Paul will probably pop in and give, <laughs> give this question. Has anyone got any questions for Beth? Um, either in on track or triathlon or any of the questions that we've covered here? <laughs> No questions. <laughs> I must have done a really comprehensive interview. <laughs> I was just searching for my mute button, Fiona. Hi, Beth. <laughs> Hi. Um, 
I just look at a couple of good wee stories from your career. Um, on you know, if we were writing your autobiography, oh we needed some headlines and nuggets to sell that book. You know, and it might actually be about you. It might actually be some star in the waiting room before the athletics race or something. I'm just looking some sort of quirky stories from your career that, you know, are not everyday type of stories. Living with Johnny Brownlee. I mean, that's got to be one. Yeah, that was quite cool, actually. I didn't, I'd, never met, I'd never met Johnny before I, I moved in. So my first meeting with Johnny was half my stuff was in his house because I moved it in before Christmas and the other half was in the boot of my car and we had our, a, a hug in the driveway. I'd never met him. I, I knew, I knew Alistair because I'd made teams with Alistair before, but Johnny and I just never crossed paths. So that was a bit random. Um, what else? What's he like to live with? Uh, he's very clean. <laughs> <laughs> he's good at washing up as well. <laughs> um, well, and he's just, yeah, he's, he can't even think. We didn't even play any FIFA together, but that was one of the prerequisites of me moving in. I had to get good at FIFA. So, um, luckily I avoided that because I'm not so good on PlayStation. Want any other nuggets? There must be some great nuggets. Of um, I don't know. Al Alistair said that I, I think before, before the European champs, he said, um, if you play your cards right, you could win, you could win this race. And he was right. So I don't know how he knew that, but, um, he's quite, he's quite insightful. And I think, yeah, he didn't even say well done afterwards. He just, he just said, I told you. So. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you can think of? I can't think. Um, I think you must have bumped into some wonderful people on the track, for example. Yeah, I've got a couple of selfies with Usain Bolt because whenever I went to Major Champs, his hundred final was always the night of the ten k. So often he'd be warming up, I'd be warming up. He was on the event after me, so you know <laughs> you're doing your drills next to like the fastest man in the world. So that was quite fun. Um, Did you get ever get a hug from him? I can't remember. I might have in Glasgow. I've definitely got a couple of pictures with him. He must be much, much bigger than you. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's towers above me, yeah. I'm quite tall for a girl, but he's still, he's pretty big. Um, Put her on the spot there, Pete. We'd have to work on her, we'd ask, have to work on her book. <laughs> let me ask you another one then. So you're on the start line, probably more an athletics race. How much, were you really focused on, I, you know, being calm, I must carry out my race plan. Yes. Yeah. I'm getting the gloves off, elbows out in this race, and I'm going, yeah. to, I'm going to boss people. You know, where, are, where are you in that dynamic through your career? And, and maybe it differs depending, obviously, on the, the level of race you're in. Yeah. Well, I, I feel like I'm more towards the kind of uh, resting bitch face on the on the start line. I'll do everything that my coach has told me not to do. Um, you know, the, in Glasgow, for example, I, I did nothing. I, he, he said, don't, he's at no point go to the front of that race. And I don't know if you watched that race, but I went, I, I think I, I got a bit bored at some, some point in the race and I went to the front and was on the front and I remember the crowd, I've never experienced anything like it, but it was so loud. It actually felt like they were kind of pushing me around the track. It was, it was odd. I've never, it was crazy, crazy loud. It was mad. Um, and I think he then thought when I did that, he was like, right, she's made a good call there. That's fine. So I don't tend, not that I don't listen to advice. I definitely do, but I, I like to kind of take a risk and I'd rather finish a race, you know, with, putting everything on the line than to to have too much left at the end and yeah thanks sean oh you're muted you're muted <laughs> there we go apologies i had to mute because apparently i coughed too much so if you're not <laughs> um it's the asthma but don't worry about it. 
you know, but <laughs> uh, any plans to maybe go longer and go to Kona one time or something like that, or is it? That's never, no, that's never really been a, no, an aspiration of mine, but I have done a lot of, I have done a lot of uh, like long rides this, you know, this on the second winter that I've been on. And um, I, I was maybe toying with the idea of doing a 70.3 like towards the end of the year. Um, Cause I, I feel like my riding and my, like I'm, I'm doing bits of swimming, so I'm sure I'm doing more than some people, but um, and my riding's going well. And I, I think, you know, over half a half marathon, I'd, I'd be okay. There was, there was a kind of distant thought that at the end of this year, if it was a normal year for me, I was, I was tempted to go to like a, a Berlin or a Frankfurt and, and do a, a marathon just, just to see, like, just to see what I could do off the back of a kind of triathlon season. I was interested to, to run a marathon uh, while I was fit, but I, I mean, there's no, there's no plan to go, to go and do a marathon after all that riding. So <laughs> definitely not. I don't think, I don't think uh, Kona would be for me. I mean, I never say never, but, um, not not at the moment. It's not it's not a, a not a name. Ah, thank you. Anybody else? Vicky, you need to unmute yourself, Vicky. That's it. Um, hi, Beth. Thank you. Um, are there any particular aspects of your training, sort of? regime or, 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 or program that you've brought through from running into triathlon that you think has really served you well? Um, I'm trying to think. I, I, I'm still, I, I know a lot of triathletes don't train on the track, um, but I, I'm still, I still get on the track once a week throughout, throughout the whole year. Um, and I think for me, that's important because you know I'm not doing the volume of volume of work um, that I was doing on on the track when I was a 10k runner. So I would have sessions that would be eight 10k, and often they would be you know 3k reps or repetitions of kilometers. But I, you know, like I've kind of come to some sort of agreement with my coach where we go on and we just we do five or six k, usually five. Uh, of just you know faster running um, and I think that's especially as you get older as well you know you, you tend to lose your speed a bit um, and I think with you don't need to do the volume on the track because you're doing so much everywhere else that you get your your aerobic base from the pool and from from running if sorry from cycling so there's not much that you need to supplement on the track with you can just you can just go and I, I found that I'm actually fresher for the track sessions strangely enough and um, my legs aren't wrecked from running but you know they're tired from other areas and um, like on the bike or in the pool but I think that's so beneficial to get you know that just that faster work uh, in in the week and you know Tuesday and Saturday are my like, I really go for those those run sessions I really hit them hard but yeah. that's the one thing I've transferred across but you know like a lot of other stuff um like my gym has changed massively it's a lot more kind of cycling orientated now and with parts of swimming and obviously um and but yeah so much has changed but I try and keep like th that kind of quality run session stuff similar and I keep it consistent throughout the year as well great thank you yes. yeah. that's good because we have a track session as part of our club um there's huge benefits to that. I think a lot of people. I've really, I've really missed. I've really missed the track during this lockdown. I, but I've actually found a cinder track up the road from me, which is three k from my house. So and it's it's four hundred and three meters. So everything's a bit out. But I think I, I I'm so glad I'm so glad I found it because I, I can still do track once a week. So that's great <laughs> for the mental side as well. Paul, oh, you've got a question. I've always got a question for you on it. You're not going to say, oh, I didn't know who Beth was. I actually saw Beth at the Commonwealth <laughs> Games. I was in the stadium. And if I remember right, it was raining really heavy that night. That was a 5K, I think. That was, the, a, 5K, was, a, that was a Friday night. Yeah. Was that Friday I was, night? I, yeah, I, was, I, I had tickets for a lot of the stadium. But anyway, the, my, my question is, is um, 
at the club, we had a huge discussion one night about um, what our favorite thing is to eat after a session. And none of it came out as healthy. Most people were talking about crisps, chips, pakora, you know, stuff like that, bar of chocolate. So what's your favorite non-healthy indulgence that uh, you would like to splash out on every now and then? I think, well, if, if I lived in California, it would be an In-N-Out burger. That's what I did when I, when I qualified, when I ran the qualifying time for, uh, for the Olympics. I think um, me and Andy Butchart, we went, we got a taxi from the track to the In-N-Out burger and we, we had <laughs> uh, a burger, fries and uh, one of those horrendously calorific milkshakes. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, a pizza maybe. Um, if I live, if I'm here, yeah, usually I get pizza post race. So yeah. Very good. Yeah. But that's kind of healthy though, is it not? I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I consider that healthy. <laughs> Say again? I would consider a pizza fight healthy compared to most things we were talking about that night. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I do like a milkshake, so maybe that. The one with ice cream and stuff, all the bad stuff in, so. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else got a question? No, surely. Matt must have a question. He's a newcomer. I've got one, Fiona, but I'll go after Matt. <clears throat> yeah, Matt, Matt, you could ask for some it, proper it, yeah. top <laughs> tips. <laughs> have, you got, have you got another 40 minutes, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Matt's uh, new to our club. Oh, okay. Hi Beth, um, Hi. thanks ever so much for uh, taking your time to come on the call. It's been great listening to you, so thanks for that. Um, I'm knocking on the door of 50 and I'm brand new to the sport in so much as I've never even been to one of the training sessions because of the lockdowns. <laughs> oh no. So I'm sort of doing it um, from YouTube and obviously going through the Facebook group and li listening to podcasts. Yeah. Uh, I'm really struggling at the moment because I'm on a calorie deficit because I'm, I come from a bodybuilding background and a martial arts background. So all my training in the past has been heavy list, lifting with a small amount of strength and flexibility. Yeah. So see, see working in a calorie deficit and then going out and trying to build any form of endurance. It's just, I actually, you know, I felt to bits today in my training session. I couldn't even manage a kilometre. Oh, so no. should I just not not bother with my calorie deficit and just let the training just get me sort of some sort of semblance of triathlon shape? I, I just don't think it's one of those sports where you where you can be in a calorie deficit. I mean, I found that out very quickly, very early, very early on, and I just yeah, I, yeah, I, I just. I even found it out at the weekend. It's been really hard to do all these long rides with no cafes open. So yeah, I think you do need to feel properly, and yeah, you you almost can get found out a little bit if you if you've mm -hmm. kind of running on empty. It's yeah, it's it kind of sets you back two days. Yeah, then, well, yeah. that's really what happened today. I think you know I yeah. struggled to even do a kilometer. You know, I just totally gassed and I'm absolutely shattered. You know, so yeah. I guess but I just I, need to leave more. I did find it difficult actually going from like I can I ate a lot when I ran and I've always been very slim um, and I've, I ate a lot when I was you know a runner and I wasn't doing anywhere near the hours like I was probably only maybe doing like eight to ten hours of training a week and now I'm I'm knocking on like 25 in, in, a, in a winter in a typical winter week 25 to 28 hours a week and I just I couldn't it got to the stage where I just you almost get sick of eating. It's it's weird. Like it's it's a chore to sit down and eat food, and it's like oh god, not again. But mm. yeah, I think it's it's so important that you feel correctly and just like eat enough to feel the sessions like the day before in and around training and afterwards as well. Right, that's fantastic. Thanks for the advice. No worries. <laughs> We have a young person in with us on Callum's iPad. Yes, hello. <laughs> Maybe you'd have a question. Uh, just during the progression to obviously from running to triathlon yeah. and upping your bike, when did you sort of start to think about things like FTP and power? 
So I actually only started using power, I think it was at the start of 2018. Yeah, maybe. And I, I didn't do an FTP test until the, the end of 2018. So I had a whole summer of, I had a whole like, I think I started using the power in uh, maybe the February time. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really look too much into it. And then I, you know, I had it on my bike, it was there. And like then if I didn't ride with power, I'd be like, where, where's, where are those numbers gone? I, I don't see them anymore. So yeah, I didn't really pay too much attention. I didn't really train to it. But then that, that following winter, so the 2018 to 2019, I did make big improvements on the bike and I did an FTP and, you know, I would track it and, and, and look and, you know, ride, ride to, to my power zones. And I did find it really useful and I, I still use it now. And I've got like, um, I haven't done an FTP this year. I was meant to do one in January. I didn't do it. Um, but I, I, I know what I'm at and, you know, it's, I, th I, th I find it a really useful too. I, I ride a lot with the boys, um, Alistair and Johnny and, and Gordon in that group. And we, we do this thing on a Thursday called Hour of Power. So it's basically, I just try and hold on to the wheel for as long as possible before I get spat at some point. But it's it's good because I, I know that there's no girl, no female in, in World Triathlon that can ride that will ride as hard as them and if I'm if I'm on their wheel then you know like I know what they're riding at and it just gives me a clear indication of kind of where I'm at and where I would be in, in a WTS field so I find it I find it really useful and I think it's it's a really useful tool um especially if if you want to so if you have your FTP and you can you can bump that FTP up two ways you can either do stuff that um is over the FTP so you pull it up from that way or you can do your base training at, which is below that and then budget up from from below so like getting getting the right mixture between you know stuff that's over ftp so like 100 and whatever percent over it and then stuff that's under like the base mileage and the the long winter miles and the long rides um i think having power and just seeing where you're at is is useful yeah you might need to explain to matt what ftp is functional threshold power so it's what you can it's what you can uh, hold for. So you do a 20 minute test and then you take 5% off that and that's what you can hold for an hour on the bike. Yeah, Thank I wouldn't you. worry about that. Wouldn't worry about it too much now. Sean, another question. Uh, just to let you know, Matt, Beth's not here every Friday. <clears throat> okay, apologies. <laughs> <laughs> um, Beth, well, you must have had a bit of time then to reflect for next year then. Any ideas on the goals that you'd be able to tell us that you might be setting for yourself. Um, Can I just butt in very quickly and just say you've got a Mark Austin problem of a darkness in your room. Oh, we do. Yeah, I'll, just, I'll just turn the light on. Hang on. <coughs> I reckon all these young triathletes haven't got any money for their electricity. No, I, I do. I just quit like sitting in the dark. So Mark, I, I, Mark Austin sat really there good. the same. <laughs> That's better. We can see you now. Anyway, carry on. Sorry. Did someone ask me a question? Yes, yeah, so because Sean, Sean was asking you about next year. Oh, next yep. year. Yeah, sorry. Um, I haven't actually, well, I'm, I'm hoping to salvage some, some kind of a season if, if we can. There's, I know there's a socially distanced triathlon in Loughborough in July. So I'm, I'm thinking about doing that. Um, Hamburg is currently on the, on the kind of race calendar. So I mean, who knows if that's going to go ahead, if it's going to... I mean, I'll have to quarantine for two weeks when I come back, if I do go. Um, I, I just don't know. I think it's too, it's too far away. There's too many uncertainties at the moment to kind of have something concrete in place. And I don't want to get my hopes up for something and then for it not to happen again, because it was quite turbulent at the start of this season. Um, but, you know, I, I, I still... I'm still going to go for the Olympics. You know, it... It's a, it's a long shot and I just think I've had, you know, like it's, I've had a lot of time to train and get stronger in areas and just kind of work away quietly without anyone really pestering me. So, um, I, I still believe I can do it. Um, maybe 2021, I thought 2020 would come too soon. Maybe 2021 was, was just all I needed, but who even knows if the Olympics will go ahead? I don't know. We just don't know. So I think until we're back to some sort of normality with, you know, training in a normal environment and back with my group, then I, I just, I don't want to set any, any goals, but the, the long-term aim for me is Paris and um, I'd hope to qualify for the team there and, and, you know, achieve what I think I can achieve there. Thanks. I think the Rossies have got a question, Fiona. 
they always have a question, the Rosses. <laughs> well, then, yes, Craig does yeah. normally. So, so my question, hi Beth. Um, hi. So you decided, you decided to um, commit to elite triathlon and you hadn't used clip-in pedals. Yeah. Please tell me that you didn't forget to unclip in a joint ride with the Brownleys and fall off like the rest of us have. Well, not the Brownleys, but I did. I was on a ride with uh, Non, and that happened <laughs> in a group ride with Non. But she was very, she was very nice about it. <laughs> she said that she'd done it several times, so it made me feel right. better. But yeah, yeah, it's kind of crazy to think that. Uh, I actually moved to Leeds and I hadn't even really, well, no, I had sorted a bike in December, but I, hadn't, I didn't even have a bike. Um, and I certainly had never ridden with clippings. Um, so, and it was, a, it was a steep learning curve, but I don't know. It seems like such a distant memory now. Um, yeah, it seems like so long ago. It's another piece of learning for Matt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually all right at that, so I have actually oh, fallen yeah. off. So that's that's one thing I've actually done at the traffic lights. In the bag. Vicky McLaren, have you got a question? Yeah, I was wondering, Beth, if your favourite discipline is still running of the three. Yeah, always, always. always. I, I actually quite like it that, you know, sometimes I have to wait an hour and a half to get to it because it's like, Right, now's my <laughs> now's my time to go. And it yeah, it's it's quite nice having something that you're not like a superpower, but like something you've got in the back pocket. And I know that when I come to that, it's almost like a sigh of relief. Like there's not much that can go wrong here. There's there's no there's I can't have a puncture. Uh I can't get dunked in the swim. Like I'm literally just running now. As long as I get my shoes on in time and I'm out, out of transition running, you know, like it's, I find it, um, I like having people, because I'm usually chasing, I, I'm like, apart from the Europeans when I came off, that was kind of odd for me, I was like, all right, okay, this is weird, but I like to have people in front that I can see and it's, it's a bit of a psychological thing with me, like picking them off one by one, it's, I, I quite enjoy that, it's sad, it's kind of, bit sadistic but I, qu I quite enjoy like picking them off one by one and you know it gives me a target to aim for. Yeah. Alistair, you've got a question. Take it, uh, hi Beth, um, how different do you find running you know as the third element of the triathlon uh, compared to you know your thing and, and that was it from start to finish? Um, so I did find it really difficult actually getting, and I, I found that a lot of my, I wasn't the quickest and I was like, why? Like running's my thing. Why am I not the quickest when I come off the bike? And it's definitely something you need to train. So definitely like I, I think as like, as well as getting, you know, um, efficient at each of the three sports, I think that's, you know, not, a, what's the other word, like economic as well. Um, you know, and, and as well as doing that across all three sports, I think it's important to not, I think practicing the transition, it's, it's, I don't think you should, you should just do that. I think it's important to do that as well. Um, but it's important to, you know, not, not skip out on the, the longer like base mileage, but I found it really beneficial uh, this last season I started it, yeah. Uh, and I actually asked Alistair, I picked Alistair's brains about this in a run. And I, I said like, you know, I just, how am I going to get better at, at running? How am I going to come off the bike and be the quickest runner? Like, I know I'm the quickest runner. Put me on the track with any of them and, I, and I'll, I'll run quicker than them. How am I going to get quicker off the bike? And he said, you need, to, you need to do chain gang and you need to go and run for two miles hard off chain gang. So every single Thursday night, I would be the last one at training because I would do chain gang and then I'd go do ten, like two miles hard off the bike and it got to the stage in a race or if I did any sort of run hard running it would feel weird to not have done chain gang before it because it got to the stage where it just felt normal and in a race I wouldn't get to three minutes in and feel horrendous I would be like well this is normal now this is what it feels like this feels fine so I, I trained that every single I think I started I was on the first chain gang back in I think when the clocks go back last weekend in March and I did it every single week right through to September. So yeah, definitely um, found that helped massively. 
Wow, well, that's really good advice, actually. Yeah. Vicky. Oh, muted, Vicky. Just a very quick one, probably also for our new member. Um, you might want to explain what chain ganging is. Yes. Yeah. Um, so it's like, this is all new to me as well. Um, so you, in Leeds we have, it's, it's, it can be very elite in Leeds. It's sometimes group, the, the first group is filled with like, you know, Lizzie Armistead sometimes turns up for this. Um, so you have two lines and the outside one is moving faster than the, it, or whatever you, want, whatever you want to call it outside, that this line is moving faster. And then once you get to the top of the the top of the line, you kind of move across and come back and you not not drop like a stone, but you you, you come back slower while this line is going through. So it's like it's like a bike. Um, if you think of a bike chain, it's going round and you're just constantly moving around like this. Um, so yeah, it's it's one of our hard workouts in the week. So it's more like a kind of um zone three, so like a, a hard threshold threshold ride. Um but I often go on the, the, the boys one and not that I pull turns because we're not always allowed to pull turns in the boys one, but it's it's quite it can get quite surgy at the back if you're on on like the kind of concertina effect if you're on the back and the chain that's sitting on the you have like the chain going round, but there's a lot of people that just sit on and get not a free ride because it is hard. But I find it quite useful because you get practice at kind of that, those spikes that you get in races where you, you know, you go around dead turns or you're going through technical parts of the course. Um, but it's usually done on a long straight road with usually fast traffic. So it is a bit of an adrenaline rush. I do love it, but it is quite scary. <laughs> I remember the first time I did it, it felt, I mean, not that I've ever taken drugs, obviously, but it felt like I would imagine it to be... <laughs> Yeah, it like is. you're to on a total high it's like because it's so fast because you're getting the drafting effect of being behind someone as well and so the yeah. speed that you're going at and that you know that if you make one tiny little mistake yeah. you could be out the side or off the bike but yeah. the speed that you're going at and having to concentrate is incredible and you're using um a lot of leg power as well as you actually side. I, I did one last summer it was the it was a couple of weeks after Europeans and Alistair I was on it was, no, none of the girls were there it was just just guys and Alistair had just done this first that Ironman he did in um, Ireland where the swim he just did the bike and the run because the swim was cancelled because of the weather and like the boys are very good with me they're like they, they, they really helped me out and I needed a bit of help with my biking at the time and often when I go on group one no boy lets no boy will let me in on chain gang like they're like no no they'll, they'll close the gap i can't get in can't sit on and i find it really difficult but alistair was there and he was taking it easy that night and he he basically just was shouting at me nicely to get on his wheel and and so it was like it was like uh the 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 Moses had parted the water because the boys were letting me in everywhere and they're like, oh, no, no, oh, she, she, she's going with Alistair, let, let her in, let her in. So I was, getting, I was basically getting to be wherever I wanted in that chain gang and it was, it was only because the Olympic champion was uh, shouting at everyone else to let me through. So that was quite funny, but I learned a lot from that chain gang. It was good. <laughs> Amazing. You say these names just like, yeah, you know, we're like all in awe. Oh my God. <laughs> You're allowed to be yeah, in the I do them every day though, so I, I see them enough and yeah. Yes, I'm not really a numbers person, but a couple of friends are. Roughly what is your FTP or your watts per kilo on the bike? I haven't I haven't I haven't done it recently. I think I've got quite a high watts per kilo. It's close to it's like a high four, but that's I'm pretty light, so but I think the last time I did an FTP it was around like two to 40 something I think but I mean I'm hoping it's gone up since then anybody else Crawford yes Crawford's come on hi Crawford's one of our coaches I know Beth <laughs> <laughs> thanks um, Beth I was just wondering during the lockdown uh, with the time to reflect and, and also try different things and training is there anything you're going to change going back into training after that, that you might have learned or or done differently? 
Um, I think I'll definitely use Zwift more. I've really enjoyed Zwift and like, especially when you can't, you know, I'm, I'm so used to doing bike sessions with groups of people or, you know, one other, and I've not been able to do that, but, and I always thought the turbo was, it's just not my bag. Um, but I've, I've honestly thoroughly enjoyed doing those Zwift races on, 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 on the computer. They've been really, they've been hard, really hard. It's like almost as hard as chain gang. I come off and I'm wrecked sometimes. Um, I think also, um, some other things I've learned, like reflected on, um, I've definitely, because I've not had access to physio, um, and I've had, I have had a couple of niggles. Like I've learned to, I have learned to listen to my body a bit more. Um, what else? I'm not the best sleeper. And I found during lockdown, I think, I don't know whether it's like, I get, I don't know whether I get anxious about getting up early because swimming's always early. And I found that I'm getting up just as early, but cause I'm not got, I'm not have to set an alarm or, you know, I'm going to bed earlier now. Um, so I don't know whether I'd maybe move some of my swims to later on in the day or just do them at, at different times. I don't know what that's, I mean, that all depends what the squad do, but I, I found it quite like, that's one thing I've definitely caught up on with during this lockdown is, is the sleep. And obviously that's like a, that's a free performance enhancer, you know, like getting, getting enough sleep is, is huge recovery. Um, anything else? Maybe starting open water a bit earlier because I'm not a big fan of open water. I don't like the cold, uh, but I've, you know, I was not forced in the river the other day, but I just did it. I didn't, I didn't really care. I, I really enjoyed the 45 minutes I was in. Um, so I think I'd maybe, I'd maybe try and look to doing that. And I think in Leeds, we're looking at doing a lot more open water, you know, soon once, once we can train with a couple more people, getting some groups together and, you know, pool swimming is completely different to open water, and at the end of the day, open water is is what you what you race at. So, um, it's just difficult with the temperature in the UK. But yeah, I have I have learned a lot, um, and just yeah, being a bit more patient and just accepting things, I guess as well, because this is out of our control now. Yeah. Brilliant. Anybody else? It's been a really great session. Thank you, Beth. It's been really interesting. No worries. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. It's great to have that somebody's, you know, transition to between the sports and um and you're still so young. So it's so much more I always fine. I always feel like I'm gonna be too old, but it's it's, it's good to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're speaking to a group of reasonably old people. <laughs> <laughs> It's great. And how are you feeling about not seeing your family up here? Must be oh, it's difficult. been really hard. I know. I was I was hoping to try and get home, but I don't know. I don't know what the latest update and I need to. Uh, yeah, I don't know what the latest update is with that. So I think it's going to be a wee while. Yeah, until the restrictions in Scotland are loosened a little bit more. But yeah, I actually haven't. I haven't seen. Um, I've seen my sister. My sister lives in Sheffield, but she's been away on. on in Australia uh, on, a, on a kind of uh, medical placement. So it's very rare for us not to see each other once a week. And I've seen her mm, for one and a half days since, since, since Christmas. So that's been really hard. And I haven't, I've seen my mum once and I haven't, I haven't seen my dad since 20, 2019. <laughs> so it's, it's a long time and I just, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to seeing them uh, in the near future, hopefully. But yeah, thank God for the FaceTime and Zoom and, all the other mm. internet <laughs> um, that you can use to speak to family that are far away just now. And it's been great for us because we've been able to get people to speak to us on these interviews, <laughs> which we would never yeah. have been able to get you to come up here to sit for an hour and a half. No, and I think everyone, so the world will change forever. Everyone will just do everything online now. So, yeah. Yeah. Just to say, Matt, we did get her one last year to our I think last year or the year before our Christmas Kaylee, where she was pretty awesome on the on the dance floor. <laughs> well, oh no, that, I think I, that was yeah, that was just before Christmas. I came up for that. Yeah. yeah. Really good. Yeah. Highlight of my year last year. <clears throat> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Beth. That's really right. good. Um, thank you so much for having me.
Thank you so much for everyone tuning in and asking some great questions as well. Thank you. Thank you.